listening to the Cross Kingdom Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message from Justin Carpenter. Um, <laughs> yeah, or yeah. What, one other thing. I don't even know why I even tried to plan anything. Uh, <laughs> Yes, Lord. Um, aren't you glad we don't like show up and th- sing three songs and stand up, sit down, and everybody's uptight like they need an enema and they're just like this? Too far? Lisa's not here, so I'm stretching the limits here. Hi, babe. <laughs> if you're watching. Okay, now that I just. Lord, come back. Okay. Um, Ann Nolly was here first service, and uh, I meant that in the most pastoral way possible, by the way. Um, Ann Nolly was here first service, and there was a real theme of the fear of the Lord in first service. I literally cried all the way through worship the first service. I mean, I was just a mess in a good way. And Ann Nolly, I was, I was sharing with everybody that... Um, I got John Bevere's book, The Awe of God, and I was listening to it on audio. And um, I, on my treadmill, I was talking about that, and Anne said that she, was, she bought the book as well but didn't get the book, and so she went on YouTube and was listening to John Bevere's teaching on the, on the Awe of God. And she got her prayer language. So she, she's, she has pursued the Lord, wanted to pray in tongues for like decades and literally the fear of the Lord, the teaching on the fear of the Lord and she got hit, she got given the gift. And I just thought that, I thought that was so cool. Um, You know, it it says that the fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. Jesus said that if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. So love looks like something, right? We can't say we love him if we're not obedient to him. And I don't mean out of a legalistic view. I mean out of a awe of God, out of a fear of the Lord. And I've been back and forth on a couple of different themes over the last couple of weeks, but the Lord kept showing me 1234 on the clock. And I wasn't looking for it, you know, because you can be right twice a day, you know what I'm saying? And um, and so I I went to the scriptures, and it was Luke 1234. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then I just started doing this word study on treasure and looking at the context of treasure from the old covenant to the new covenant. And... I think we have a whole lot of treasures that need to be removed from the treasure chest of our hearts. We need a divine exchange. There's things that we have put in front of the Lord. It's not necessarily that they're bad, but they're not God. Remember the tree of knowledge of good and evil? There's good on that tree. And there's going to be a whole lot of people that go to hell partaking from the tree of good and evil, being deceived, thinking they're taking the tree of life. Remember, it says that there's a way that seems right unto man, but in the end it leads to death. Wide is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the path that leads to life, and few find it. One of the reasons why we're in such a um, pruning season, if you will, with the, with the body of Christ and the leadership in the body of Christ is because of the lack of the fear of the Lord. And it says judgment starts first in the house of God. So God starts dealing with his leaders first. And I think, well, I think Danny left. She was, after a service and a half, she was, I was ready to leave almost, almost whew, two hours of drumming. But Danny, Danny mentioned it. It's the simplicity of the gospel. He's bringing us back. When you think of what you treasure this morning, what do you treasure? 
Where, because that is exactly where your heart is. You can't value something. You can't have affection for something. You can't focus on something that you love without your heart being attached to it. So what is the treasure that you have this morning? Let me ask it this way. When you come under stress, when you come under pressure, when you come under conflict, you come under sufferings, where is the first place you go to? Because that's what's going to reveal your heart. That's what you treasure. That's what you're leaning on. That's what you're trusting in. Are you with me? We have robbed the Holy Spirit of so much comfort in the American church because of the lack of the fear of the Lord and a lack of understanding how, how spiritually poor the American church has been. I said in first service, um, Heidi Baker, had, she, didn't, she didn't like traveling all over the United States and, and it, she would rather be in the bush and, and with, her, with her people and she'd rather because of their hunger, she said. And, and Heidi, the Lord spoke to Heidi and said, yeah, Heidi, but the United States is a third world, spiritually third world country. Spiritually third world. So let that sink in because I think many times we probably mirror the church of Laodicea more than anything. The greatest blessing we've ever been given in the American church is called prosperity. It's a gift, it's a blessing, and it's not wrong, but I think we have blown it with stewardship of prosperity because what happens is God becomes plan B. And we begin to look to all these other things that we've stored up into our hearts that we have treasured. And it's okay if God doesn't do this or, you know, sometimes we pray and it's like, well, if he doesn't, I'll just go do this. Come on. Well, I'll give the Lord a shot for a second here. But if he doesn't come through with this, I'm going to go over here. Y'all, being at the cuffs of the promised land, what did they have to do? They had to step into the water by faith to get it to part. And guess what? Israel, when they came out of Egypt, they didn't have anywhere to go. Either get in the water or get taken out by the enemy. The enemy was right behind them. They were hedged in. Now, they had some help, you know, the, 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 the cloud went behind them. What are you, what are you going to do? What, what is faith? Because so many times, I, I said this earlier, right now two of, the big, two of the biggest giants, not the only ones, in the Western church is secular humanism and religion. And, and it's crazy how secular humanism has come into the church with a religious skirt on it. So it looks spiritualized. Do you understand the definition of secular humanism? I'll tell you, thanks. (laughs) Secular humanism is a, a philosophy, belief system, or life stance that embraces human reason, logic, secular ethics, and philosophical naturalism. That, that it, human reason, logic, secular ethics, philosophical naturalism. The church needs to be delivered of the me syndrome, self. Everything is about self right now. Self this, self that, self this, self that. And Jesus said, if you don't lose your life, you'll never find it. He's called us to give our lives away, y'all. Every day we wake up, we're supposed to take up our cross and follow him. The simplicity of the gospel, the great commission. See, here's the cold hard facts right now. Most of the church never shares their faith, ever. Most believers never share the gospel with anyone. If you think you're called to the nations and you won't go next door to your neighbor, you're fooling yourself. 
but you'll talk about what you're in love with. Remember when you first, for the, all y'all that are married, when you were first dating your spouse, all those warm, fuzzy feelings and people couldn't stand being around you because all you wanted to do was talk about your girlfriend or your boyfriend and they're like, oh my goodness. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters, for either they will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Some translations say mammon. You know, it says, Jesus said it's easier for a rich man to get into heaven than a... uh, I just blew that verse. Yes. (laughs) Hold on, rewind. Let me... Let me rewind real quick. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than a rich man to get into heaven. Is that better? Okay. And our Western thought process, we always think of a threading needle. So it's like, well, everybody rich is going to hell. The problem is the eye of the needle is the entrance to a city. And when the camels would go in, they would have to get down on all fours and actually be helped through the, into the entrance. So what does that mean? It says it's not impossible for a rich man to go to heaven, but he has to humble himself, not trust his riches, and trust Jesus to get in. Colossians 2, 2 2-3 says that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which Christ... Uh, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Why is it that we keep trying to figure out a different way? I'll tell you why. Because then we're in control. If you're in control of the process, you don't need faith. If you think you're in control of the outcome, you don't need faith. If you find yourself only going to Jesus when you're in crisis, that's not love. You're treating him like a psychologist. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Do we treasure the kingdom that way? Do we really believe that the kingdom is worth giving everything up for to get it? Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. It cost you everything. Salvation's free, but your relationship, if you want to know him, if you want to walk with him, it costs you everything. He's a king. It's not a democracy. We don't get to vote once a year on whether or not we're going to be obedient to this section of, the, of his word. So many times we just fit them in. We fit them into our lives when it's convenient. We let the fear of what others think stop us from ministering to people because of the fear of man. 
forgetting that one day when they breathe their last, they're going to heaven or hell. We allow being politically correct to quench the power of God because we won't release what he told us to because we fear people. We treasure the applause and the affection of men more than God. Y'all, we, we talk about the disciples, specifically talk, we talk about Peter and how Peter, he was a hot mess, right? Can we all agree Peter was a hot mess? But something happened to him when the, when the day of Pentecost came. Something changed with Peter when the Holy Spirit came upon him. And the one who just denied Jesus three times turns around and at the end of his life refuses to be crucified the way his Lord was because he wasn't worthy and he was crucified upside down. Jesus said that it's better that I leave so the promised one can come. The God of the universe is inside every one of you that know him. And yet we're living on a level of spirituality that many times is even less than the old covenant. I remember coming out of a cessationist background and I would read the old covenant and I'd read the prophets and I'd see what the Lord did with them and my heart would burn and I, told, I remember telling the Lord, Lord, I'd rather have been alive in the old covenant and experience you the way these guys had than what I get right now. Amen. See, I think Jesus is asking us right now, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than fill in the blank? Think of something that you love. Do you love him more than that? John Bevere in his book, he was in Brazil <clears throat> years ago. 3,000 people in this auditorium. Best worship team in all of Brazil was there leading worship. And he walks in, and no one is paying attention. People are going in and out of the, out of the auditorium, buying food in the back. They're talking to each other. They're, they're more excited to see each other than they are Jesus. And he goes, Lord, what is going on? Why is your tangible presence not here right now? And he told him, there's no fear of the Lord. So he stood up there and silently just kept complete silent and stared at all 3,000 people and kept staring at them until everybody got quiet. You could hear a pin drop. And then he began to correct them for the lack of the fear of the Lord. He gave an altar call and 75% of the people in that auditorium showed up. They came to the front. Then the Lord fell again. And every, people were crying and getting delivered and healed and um, recommitting their lives to the Lord. And then right towards the end of the meeting, he, uh, he said, the Holy Spirit told him, I'm going to come one more time. And he goes, they were not prepared for what the Lord was about to do. And all of a sudden, a sound. They said, they said it was as loud as a 747, like... I mean, just intense, roared through that auditorium for about 90 seconds. And it was the sound of the Holy Spirit. Like Acts 2, when it says, in the sound of a mighty rushing wind, it was that supernatural sound of the mighty rushing wind that drew everybody into that re- from that region to that exact location because they heard the sound. And I was listening to this audio book on my treadmill. 
And I heard the Lord say, and that's how it's going to start with you. And I did one of those jerks that, you know, I do every once in a while. Thank God I was walking on my treadmill, not running, because I have a glass door behind my treadmill. I would, I would have gone viral. But it's, the, it's not by happenstance that God is highlighting the fear of the Lord right now. And put, I mean, it's on our eldership team's hearts. It's been on my heart for months. Kylie did an amazing job teaching on the fear of the Lord last week. And because the fear of the Lord is the entrance into the glory of the Lord. David said in Psalm 119, 11, I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I want to challenge you all this morning. Let the Lord go deep. Get raw. Get vulnerable with him. Say, Lord, what am I loving more than you right now? What am I treasuring greater than my relationship with you? What am I trusting in? What are you trusting in? Are you trusting in our government? Good luck with that. Either side. What are you trusting in this morning? We're living in perilous times. And, and they're going to become more intense. We're going to see the greatest outpouring ever. And all the while, we're going to see gross darkness increase. We're going to see both these tensions happening. And it says in the last days, men's hearts will fail them for fear. But what do you treasure? Do you want to get so close to him that you can sleep in the bottom of the boat? And, and look at everybody else like they're crazy because you're at total peace in the, in the midst of the boat taking on water. Y'all get that, right? Yeah. Professional fishermen were scared to death because of that storm. And what I love was Jesus had just spent hours on the mountain praying that night. And it says, and he sees them afar off struggling. He looks out there and he goes, oh, there they are. They didn't get very far, did they? And so he just starts walking on the water. And it says he was going to pass right by him. He literally was going to pass right by him. I don't think he was pretending. Because there's something that happens inside of us when we struggle. Because we get to the end of ourselves and then we're ready to surrender. You know why some of you have cycles of defeat in your life right now? Because you love the pacifier you still find value in the coping mechanism. And it's not until we get to the end of ourselves, we no longer find value in that coping mechanism that that is when we typically surrender and give something up. So God in his grace will let you be miserable because he knows where it goes. If you want to hold on to something, he's a gentleman. He'll let you toil with that thing until you finally go, I give up! And he's like, finally. Because as you keep pulling for more rope, pulling for more rope, you finally get to the end of it and there he is. Okay, I got to land. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 11. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. Why? So that the life of Jesus 
may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are, um, are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Jesus didn't call you to build a a kingdom of self-protection. He didn't call you to go into a holy huddle. He called you to give your life away. It's the whole reason why he showed up. It said the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and offer his life a ransom for many. No greater love than this that a man should lay down his life for his friend. If you want your marriage to get better, then lay your life down. Love's not self-seeking, so stop self-seeking. We made a, uh, I made a post yesterday. I'm going to land with this. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. 1 Corinthians 14.1 Could it be that we've pursued the gifts and only desired love when we should pursue love and desire the spiritual gifts? Pursue love. Pursue it. Don't just desire love. We talk a lot about love in the church. And if we would pursue it, if we would pursue his love, we would see a transformation inside of us that we've only dreamed of. But we've had a counterfeit love in the church. We've had a love that when it's convenient, when it benefits us, we do these things. I still, I still marvel at the reality that Jesus, when he picked the 12, he knew exactly every one of them, who they were, what they would do, <clears throat> and it never changed his mind, right? Anybody ever been hurt? Okay, we're all in the same boat. Jesus did not judge Judas based on a life he had not yet lived. That is injustice. But yet he loved him all the way through. He knew what he was going to do and he still loved him. You want to know if you're loving? How do you love your enemy? How do you love people that that you consider an enemy? If, If you're loving well, you're going to love them exactly the way Jesus said to Y'all understand that this love that we're called to pursue is a supernatural love that the world does not have the capacity to love because it's God's love that's not inside of them. But that love is inside of you the moment you repent and give your life to Jesus. The problem is you're striving in your soul trying to preserve your soul all the while trying to hold on to this love when that love only is truly displayed when you take up your cross, deny yourself, and you actually find your life in him, and then you can love like him. All right, prayer teams. Bueller. Wayne, if I can get some keys, sir. Thank you for listening. For more messages and other resources, please subscribe to this podcast or go to our website at www.crosskingdom.org.